I've got a follow-up experiment to propose, which is that if you decrease the reliability of the robot, but you increase the quality of the cookies, how many people are likely to follow the robot with the better cookies that might is more likely to lead them to their doom? I mean, I'd let that robot in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all we need to but know. We, we did confirm that, yeah, the, the box was actually as if it were good cookies. Yeah. So I guess we don't know the the... The humans knew what quality so of cookie they were getting. The, the box, uh, so it was like a, a plexiglass container, oh, and okay. you could see inside the box, but the box had a little lock on it. So they didn't know that there were crummy cookies inside. I give Serena points for even bothering to put cookies inside in that situation. <laughs> um, but if, if I'm remembering what it looks like correctly, I, I, in my mind I'm remembering a plexiglass box with a lock on it. So I don't think they actually knew uh, and probably couldn't smell cookie smell or anything. So, so the problematic conclusion of this is that eventually robots will be capable of baking their own poisonous cookies <laughs> and bribing us with them. I see no other future. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was wondering, with all the robot research that you've done, have you found anybody who's trying to implement Asimov's free loves of robotics in any uh, way possible? I, th that's not uh, something we investigated deeply. My understanding is among AI people, those rules aren't considered sufficient to keep robots from killing all of us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, but there's a guy um, uh, in Berkeley named Eliezer Yudkowsky, probably some of you know him, uh, who, who's into that. And if you want someone who will talk to you about it for three hours, uh, just ping him sometime. Thanks. Um, so you've got a chapter about robots and you've got a chapter about biology. What about the mixes of everything? Like if we can't print real organs or if we can't have enough, why don't we replace them with, you know, robotic parts? At which point, like probably during your research, you also found really interesting things that mixes every single chapter of your book at the same time, like AI <laughs> plus virtual reality plus robotic parts. I mean, so what about that? So just to make sure I understood the question, the question is why aren't we working on robot replacements for our organs? Well, that would be a solution if we can't, yeah. you know, it's yeah. scarce resource. Yeah, so uh, we actually, we interviewed a guy named Gabor Forgotch, uh, and we were talking to him about bioprinting. So the idea with bioprinting, for anyone who doesn't know, is that you get uh, a 3D printer that instead of printing with, like, extruded plastics, which I think is how we're most familiar with 3D printers right now, is that it prints with human cells. So you would collect some cells from yourself, grow them up into large numbers, and then you would extrude them uh, and essentially print a, lever, a liver, for example, from the bottom up. So as you'd go, you'd have liver cells and you'd have vasculature that's made sort of as you're printing up as you go. So one of the advantages of 3D printers is that you can specify internal structures, which would include things like the vasculature. So uh, you can make these organs out of your own cells, and that makes it, one, quicker to get the organs because you're not on a list where you could potentially be stuck on that list for months to years. And then for the rest of your life, you don't have to take immunosuppressive drugs because it's your own cells. There's no chance of your body fighting your own cells, uh, usually. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, you'll have a higher quality of life for the rest of your life because you don't have to take these immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, so when we were talking to Gabor Forgotch, he works, he runs a company called Organovo, and they're working on printing entire organs, and I promise I'm gonna eventually get to the answer to your question. <laughs> uh, he's working on printing entire organs, and in the meantime, he's printing thin slabs of organs, and uh, these thin slabs are useful for things like drug testing. So if you are working on a drug for maybe treating like hepatitis on the liver, in a liver, if your drug kills all your liver cells in the thin slab, you maybe don't spend the time, money, and potential human, human suffering to bring it to the next stage of human trials. Um, but anyway, so when we were talking to him, we asked him, you know, how long do you think it's gonna take before we can make a perfect replica of the human liver or of a human heart, for example? And he said that he felt like that shouldn't even be the goal. The goal should be for smart bioengineers to figure out the essential functions of an, organ, of an organ, you know, so for the heart, it's pumping blood through our body, and then recreate that in whatever way is the most efficient. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that evolution has come up with the best solution for pumping blood through our body. Maybe some combina combination of robotic parts and human cells would be most efficient at pumping blood through our body, or maybe you do away with the cells entirely and you just have a robotic heart. Uh, so there are definitely people out there 
whose minds are more open to melding biology and uh, you know robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are purists who are working on just making the cells to try to recreate exactly what our what evolution has given us uh, for our organs. So that's a good question. There are people who are working on that, which was the short answer. <laughs> uh, I was just curious. Uh, What's the thing that you are most excited about happening soonest uh, for both of you? Hmm, you want to go first? Yeah, so we, we do this chapter called Precision Medicine, which is kind of about the ideas in, well, in some amount of time we don't do predictions. Uh, there'll be a system where when you go to the doctor, you'll kind of talk to a statistical molecular consultant who will take you know, a range of tissue samples, run a lot of statistical tests, get a bunch of information uh, and ideally be able to help you more effectively than in the modern system. So there's this cool recent discovery, I want to say as recent as 2015, called CTDNA, which is short for circulating tumor DNA. And it just turns out you can have a solid tumor, and I believe it was in a blood test, you can detect that mutant genome. And you can imagine this is a pretty tricky problem, right, because it's a mutant version of your own genome that has these particular differences that are, are dangerous. Um, and so part of why that's really cool is some cancers are mostly dangerous because you don't detect them early enough. Um, either because they're, they're subtle or because they, they seem like some other more likely disease. Uh, so if you had a system where you could just take a blood test and it would say, hey, by the way, there's, you, you have uh, the signature for a particular kind of breast cancer, that would be pretty amazing because then you could detect it early, which would give you a much better uh, chance of survival. So to me, that's really exciting. Uh, so it's hard for me to pick one technology that I'm the most excited about because I'm excited about a lot of them. So I'm excited about... I guess my, my top two at this exact moment, but if you ask me tomorrow, the answers could be different, uh, are robotic construction and gene drives to elimin eliminate malaria. Which would you rather hear about? Uh, robotic construction. Okay. Good choice. Uh, so, so our houses uh, often, at least in the United States and the suburbs where we live, this is true, uh, look very similar. And it takes a long time to build them. People come out to build them. And for almost any other manufacturing task, that isn't the case. Uh, and a bunch of our houses look very similar and a bit boring. So there are individuals who are working on uh, making robots that do a lot of housing construction. And for a long time, when people worked on this, it turned out that the robots were no better than the people and just kind of a pain to have out on the construction sites. But that's sort of starting to change. So there's one technology called SAM, or the Semi-Automated Mason. And SAM essentially does bricklaying. And bricklaying may not sound like a complicated task. You know, you just take a brick, you stick some mortar on it, you lay it on top of the other bricks and you're done. It's practically pixelated. But it turns out that you know to become a bricklayer, that requires two to five years of training. And it is a, a fairly complicated task. So for example, if you push the brick down too hard, then the mortar squeezes out and makes a mess. And over the course of building a brick wall, the mortar that you're working with changes viscosity. So it dries out a little bit. And when it dries out, that changes how hard you need to push down on the brick uh, and various other things about the process. So it's been very hard to teach robots how to do this process. Uh, but Sam has kind of figured it out. So Sam works along with a person, which technically makes it a cobot, uh, <laughs> cobot being a robot that works in tandem with a human. Uh, and essentially, <laughs> Sam starts laying the bricks, sticking the mortar on there, and a human comes along and cleans up the mortar behind him. So that process, that step the robot doesn't do. Um, and this robot, coupled with a human, are able to lay bricks three times faster than a normal human doing the process. So it happens much more quickly, so presumably you could have a lot more beautiful, larger brick houses. And then there's country, or, uh, companies like Contour Crafting, and what, what this, uh, this is uh, Baruch Koshnevitz from the University of Southern California, and essentially it's a giant gantry, which is like a U that's upside down, and hanging from the top of the U is a 3D printer that extrudes cement that's meant for housing. And so it goes around and it lays the foundation of the house. And it also has a big robotic arm. And it can take that arm and as it's making the outside of the house, putting the house together layer by layer with the bottom layer drying as the next layer is going on top of it, it can also lay the plumbing in the house. And the only thing that's left when the house is done is you have to put the windows and the doors in but otherwise the house is finished. And the house is finished in about 24 hours for I think $5,000, I'm forgetting the exact number, but it's cheap and it's really fast. Uh, and you can customize this. So you can tell this robot to make you know, your house with like a circular room over here, a square room over here. And anyway, so it's cheap, fast, and customizable. So we thought that was kind of neat. And uh, 
Baruch is working on trying to get that technology coupled with NASA. I think he has some NASA funding to see if you could use this maybe on Mars to build space colonies before people get up there. And it would be better to have a robot doing that sort of thing because there's radiation and blah, blah, blah. It's just not a great place to build. Uh, so you'd probably want a robot to set stuff up before you start sending in your colonists. Uh, so anyway, I'm excited about robot con robotic construction. We talk about some other ideas for how to use robots to make like beautiful marble busts or to carve wood into beautiful shapes for your home and blah, blah, blah. So robotic construction, I think, is pretty exciting with some potential negative downsides uh, in terms of like worker jobs and stuff, which <laughs> is important. And if someone wants to talk about that, we can go, I can blah, blah, blah about that as well. <laughs> Oh, what if the robot thinks it's their house? Uh, well, take it to Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. Anytime it misbehaves, it goes to Philly. Do we have any questions from the balcony? Yeah. Um, did you have a topic uh, for the book that you kind of scratched afterwards because it wasn't quite going where you wanted to go? Yeah, I can't see where you are, Bill. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Whatever. We actually, the book closes uh, with something we call the Graveyard of Lost Chapters. Uh, the idea is um, we, we um, so we're getting into emerging fields, a bunch of different ones, and before we go in, we don't really know what they're like in, in, in a lot of ways. We don't know if they're legit. We don't know how complicated they are. Uh, so we had four chapters we did a pretty significant amount of research on before deciding we couldn't uh, bring it to the book. So very quickly, uh, one was on quantum computing. It turns out, I don't know if there are any quantum computing people here, but uh, we came to feel like if, 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 if someone says they can explain quantum computing to you in under, under like 5,000 words, they're probably not explaining quantum computing to you. It's just a really complicated field. To we, 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 I think we did more research on that chapter than any finished chapter, because to explain it, you have to understand a decent amount of basic quantum mechanics. And then you have to understand what a computer is at a fundamental level, which, which I don't think most people do. Um, and then you, the hardest part, well, second hardest part is you have to explain something called complexity classes, because if you don't understand that, you don't understand why a quantum computer is interesting. There's this idea that a quantum computer is just a faster, better computer, which it's not. It's a computer that can solve a certain class of problems. Um, and then fourth, you have to explain how that all comes together to make this device called a quantum computer, and we just, there's no chance. Um, so we, we gave up after writing like a 20,000 word chapter that wasn't even close to finished. And spending uh, two months researching. It was two months, yeah, it was awful. Um, <laughs> we made some really nerdy friends though, writing that one, so. <laughs> Um, we, we did a chapter, we got pretty far in a chapter called Room Temperature Superconductors. Um, so you may know superconductors, it's a material that can conduct losslessly, you know. So normally when you send power down uh, a copper wire, you lose some of the energy um, to just the electrons bouncing against things in there. Uh, and um, so superconductor avoids that. But the thing about superconductors, they also do a lot of other really cool stuff. Um, so if you throw a current that keeps going around a loop, well, you've got a magnetic field. And it turns out between that and this other thing called the Meissner effect, you can put a thing above a superconductor and it'll float above it, but it'll also sort of lock to it. Um, so you can turn it upside down and it'll, it'll still stay there. You can turn it sideways, it'll stay there. It's, it's, it's really magical to see. Um, and the other cool thing, which is probably a bad idea, is you could build a maglev train that could go upside down. Um, <laughs> You might, you, hopefully you get a heads up. Um, but, uh, so there's all these really cool things. Oh, one other on that, if, if you have a floating thing, you can spin it. Uh, so you can have this um, power storage mechanism where whenever uh, you want to store energy, you just spin up this floating disk, and it, it, it loses very little energy. The problem, of course, is you have to keep it cold to keep superconducting. Um, uh, the, the, the very best superconductor we've ever done, I think, is at negative uh, 100 Celsius, I want to say. It's, it's in the book. Okay. Don't quote me on that. But, but, but like... That's a pretty exciting temperature. When it got to the point where liquid nitrogen could cool, that was exciting. So the idea with room temperature superconductors is you could have it sitting here and you'd have a floating thing. Um, <clears throat> so as far as we understood from talking to researchers, there's no physical reason this is impossible. Uh, the, uh, the class of superconductors in question are still not well understood. But the sense we got, one, it was really hard to explain how this stuff worked. That's one thing we always try to do is explain how the concept works, uh, not just what it could do um, to do um, Superconductors, uh, we, we actually got a textbook on superconducting, which was a mistake, because it's like, I opened it up and it literally, so the, the explanatory theory for, uh, the, um, for a lot of superconductors is what's called BCS theory, and this was a book on the topic, and it said, now this is really intimidating, and I was like, great. Um, so, so even for people in the field, I guess it's pretty hard to understand, and, and we, we got into it a bit and just didn't feel like we understood it well enough or, or could explain it well enough. But also, one of the really exciting things in principle about room temperature superconductors 
is you have lossless transmission. Um, so we assume there's a lot of loss of energy um, due to transmission from power plants to your house. It turns out, uh, at least in the US, the numbers are not so bad. It's like 10% loss or something. It's not crazy. So meaning, you know, the, the cost to fix this to go to, even if you had a room temperature superconductor, would be you'd have to rip out all these copper wires, completely replace them with a material that's um, pretty hard to manufacture in order to fix a 10% deficit. It seems like you'd be better off just building an extra couple power plants. Um, so that didn't seem super feasible to us. So anyway, for all these reasons, we ended up scrapping it. Uh, we did one on space-based solar power, uh, which seems really, it, um, seemed kind of tantalizing. We, we read a calculation that said a panel in space could get about 40 times more energy per area than one on the ground. That's because there's no weather, there's no day-night cycle. You can move its position uh, closer to the sun. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, it just turns out, if you look at the economics, you're probably better off building uh, 40 extra panels down here. Uh, so, and, and that will probably also be the case. In fairness to the people who are interested in this, um, the, the, the drop in solar panel pricing happened pretty recently, so they might not have anticipated that. I don't know. But we talked to some NASA people. They basically agreed with that point. So that seemed like, even under its best situation, it was not feasible. And then last, oh, we cut, we had a chapter on what's called advanced prosthetics, uh, meaning a lot of different kinds of cool prosthetics, but, but the most advanced would be what's called neuroprosthetics. It's sort of a direct bridge between your brain and a robotic limb. And we cut it for two reasons. One, it's largely subsumed in a chapter we did called brain computer interfaces. Uh, but two, a lot of what was exciting was really like ticky tacky technical stuff. Like, so there's this paper we thought was really cool about how the faster you run, the more you turn your ankle out a little. You you don't think you think of your ankle as a very simple machine. It actually does a lot of complicated stuff. Uh, you know, so in prosthetics, obviously the hand is the really hard thing to do. But it turns out even an ankle is really complicated. But getting into that that explanation, like we thought was going to be pretty boring for most people, uh, so we decided not to. So yeah, uh, we also, um, not in the book, right before publication, we scrapped a chapter on advanced nuclear fission for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, so lots of research on the ash heap. Uh, <laughs> we, we had a fun nota bene that also yeah. ended up on the ash heap. Uh, so it's a nota bene on mirror humans. So this idea uh, is forwarded by George Church at Harvard, who has lots of awesome ideas, and he has a hand in tons of really cool biology research. But the idea here is that uh, so living organisms are made out of molecules that have a mirror version. So this is called chirality, uh, and you can think about mirror versions as like our hands, okay? So your hands are not the same. You can't lay them on top of each other uh, and have them look exactly the same, but they're made out of all the same parts. And so presumably, uh, all of like the amino acids in our body have a structure that's the mirror version uh, that we happen to not have. So we have uh, like... I think it's left-handed amino acids or something like that. We have all one version of amino acids, for example. So the idea is that you could make an, organ, an organism where all of the versions are flipped to their mirror opposite. And if you did that, that organism would be completely safe from any parasites or pathogens because parasites and pathogens are expecting a certain mirror version to lock onto and then infect that organism. So you could be free from something like malaria if you could make mirror humans, for example. Uh, so that, that's many steps away, mirror humans. And the reason we stuck it in the graveyard is because we feel like it doesn't really solve the problem because you wouldn't be able to mate with these mirror humans because none of the parts would be compatible. I mean, you well, could physically have sex with the mirror <laughs> human, but at the biological, at the chemical level, uh, none of the parts would be compatible. So they would essentially be a brand new species, and this brand new species would be immune to any kind of parasite or pathogen, and then we would be like the riddled zombies walking the world <laughs> as the mirror humans sort of look on in disgust. And so we felt like making a whole new species uh, selfishly didn't help us much. So we, we decided that, yes, that might be some way to er eventually eradicate disease, but it wasn't really solving the problem from the standpoint of humans living today, and these mirror organisms would need mirror food to be made so that they could digest it uh, and survive. That's how we could control them. That's, yeah. So anyway, it got kind of complicated. Um, should I tell the caraway story? Because it's kind of... Yeah, sure. Okay, so, so we're, we're, we're on a roll now. So uh, caraway and spearmint... Those two flavors are mirror versions of one another. And so uh, we didn't know that at first. We discovered that while we were researching. And so we were wondering if you could make what looked like rye bread, because uh, caraway gives you this distinctive flavor of rye, uh, but actually had like spearmint in it, 
and you could give it to a mirror human, and based on their response, like if they thought the bread tasted good or gross, you would know that they were detecting the opposite molecule than what you had intended. Does that make sense? Okay, so we wanted to know if you could detect mirror humans this way. So we contacted a guy who specializes in uh, taste and smell. He's Steve Munger at the University of Florida, Florida State University. Correct, yeah. um, and so we were like, we've got a question you probably haven't heard before. Uh, and he was like, sure. And so he like let us send him an email right away. We found him on Twitter. And he was like, yeah, that's a question I've never heard before. <laughs> and, uh, and, and really, I have no idea what the answer is. It, it d totally depends on how mirror humans would detect molecules. Would it be the same way as the way we do it? Uh, and so at the end, we didn't get an answer to our question, but we had a lot of fun, and we <laughs> totally wasted uh, a scientist day. But, but yeah, I think he had fun, too. Yeah. So anyway, mirror humans. <laughs> Yes. So you seem to talk a lot about the technology and a little bit about the impact. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier. What are your thoughts on like uh, automation driving loss of jobs and how that impacts economies in the world? Uh, sure. So, so the, I, we talked to a number of different economists. We talked to uh, Brian Kaplan and Noah Smith, for starters. Uh, and essentially what they told us was you really can't predict what's going to happen. So Sam, who's the semi-automated mason, uh, does the work of three bricklayers when he's coupled with one, when it is coupled with one bricklayer. So you could predict that what would happen would be that two bricklayers would lose their job, one bricklayer who's maybe less well-trained because he's just assisting the robot would get paid less and would work with Sam, and you'd lose a bunch of jobs in this highly prized field where you, you get a really good wage uh, for, a couple, for you know, two to five years of training. Uh, but it's really hard to predict. So for example, when textiles became mechanized, uh, we thought that you'd lose a lot of textile jobs, but it turned out that all of us just bought more junk. We all, all just, we all bought more clothes and you didn't end up with major job loss. So it could be the case that once you have Sam making these beautiful brick houses for a third of the cost, a lot more of us will have bigger brick houses or we'll just build a lot more things out of bricks and that that might save some of the jobs. Or you could end up in a situation where you do lose two-thirds of the bricklaying jobs, uh, but you end up with some more jobs that are high-paying, making SAM, manufacturing SAM, working on improving SAM. Uh, so you could end up with a situation where what SAM does is increase income inequality. So you could have a bricklayer who gets paid less because he's not doing most of the work, he's just helping SAM. Uh, which I'm sure is still hard work. Uh, and then you get someone else who gets paid more because they're working on uh, improving Sam and they're you know, maybe a software or some sort of engineer. So whether or not we end up in a situation where there's more jobs, less jobs, uh, more jobs of one kind that pay more or less, it's hard to know what future we're gonna end up in, but uh, and it, you can imagine it taking a couple decades for that to all work out as different groups start adopting these sorts of technologies. So I think the answer is we don't know. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. We've got a question at the back. Um, whether or not you used it in the book, I was just curious about what the most sort of crazy interview experience that you had. <laughs> oh. Gerwin. Yeah, it must have been Gerwin. So, um, <laughs> so uh, brain computer interfaces, uh, Zach has alluded to this already. The idea is that you have a little device on your brain that is sort of monitoring what your brain is doing and is trying to figure out what it is that you want to do, or maybe it's monitoring, oh, are you getting sleepy and now you're driving your car, so I should you know, make you a little bit more attentive, try to wake you up a little bit. Uh, so these are essentially just devices that figure out what we're thinking, what's going on with our brain, and then respond in some way. Uh, and so I asked uh, this guy named Gerwin Schock, who's uh, at a college in Albany, what he thought the future of this field would be. And what I expected his answer to be was, you know, we're going to end up with amazing prosthetics. Uh, people who are quadriplegics will suddenly be able to have, you know, all of their ability to pick things up. It'll be like nothing bad ever happened. Uh, that's what I was expecting. But the answer he gave me was that uh, at one point, we're going to be able to connect all of our brains and share all of our thoughts and become essentially one big superorganism. And so for a moment, I didn't know what to say because that sounds horrible to me. Uh, I, I think that marriages and society work because you don't say everything that you're thinking. Um, but he made a really, he made a good point. Uh, and his good point, he made a number of good points. One of them that really resound, or resonated with me was that, uh, so we all have experiences that 
we would really like to share more deeply with each other, but in some cases, words don't really meet like meet your needs. So maybe you, you know, went out in the woods and you had this amazing experience where the birds were chirping and you could smell some flowers and everything was beautiful and peaceful. Uh, And I personally couldn't explain that well enough that somebody would feel like they were actually there with me. But if we could connect our brains, you could feel that completely. Uh, Or if we could connect your brain, connect our brains, maybe somebody who's experiencing depression could share with someone else what that's like. So, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you're depressed. Why don't you go on a jog? Won't that solve it? Uh, but if you could share with someone what depression was really like, they, they might understand that more deeply and, you know, be more sympathetic. And maybe as a, an entire species, we would understand each other better. Um, but Gerwin also noted that you could sit next to your partner and think, oh, maybe I want to leave my wife. And she would know that immediately. <laughs> and, and that might not be so good. I think that's exactly what he said. That might not be so good. Uh, and I agree, that would not be so good. And so, um, so I think this is an exciting idea. And actually, I loved talking to this guy because he was so passionate and so excited about what he studied. I think we would all be so happy if we could find jobs that we loved as much as he loves. Uh, but then the other interesting thing was I assumed that this was maybe just... Uh, Dr. Schalk's view of the the future of this field. And so I asked the other people that I was interviewing uh, as part of that chapter what they thought the future of the field was. And they gave me the prosthetics answer that I was expecting. And then I said, oh, so it's not to make one big, like, brain in a cloud that gets shared. I was like, that's just Gerwin. And they're like, well, no. I mean, that's, that's where we'll go next. <laughs> and I was like, what? That's, that's not where we'll go next. And so... <laughs> So anyway, I, I think a lot of them, you know, are not explicitly working to make that a reality. They're focusing on, you know, more things like treating freezing gait and blah, blah, blah. But, but apparently this is something that that field is working on, and that was really surprising. So that was my most surprising interview. Alvin Roth was on a treadmill when I interviewed him. That was interesting also. He won a Nobel Prize, so I was really happy to get his exercise uh, hour as an interview time. Yeah, um... Thanks for this wonderful book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. But my question still is, Zach, will you still do the children's book about the rabbit struggling with Camus' problem of suicide? Oh. Uh, this is from a comic. What, what, what did yeah. I say? It was rabbits. Camus' problem of suicide? Uh, rabbits dealing with Camus' problem of suicide. Oh. <coughs> uh, or any other philosophical any, book any other coming I- up. Uh, I have no plan to write that kid's book. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem like a big seller. I don't know. Maybe in France. Uh. <laughs> I would buy Hi. I uh, have two questions, actually. First one, which one of your chapters will happen soonest? And the second one, I cannot uh, get out of my mind the robot who left the house because this is sort of a behavior he uh, or it uh, showed have there has there been any example of differential in behaviors like I don't know more male more female more cheerful more sad do can it be has it been ever expressed in robots uh, have have we looked to see how males and females respond differently to robots no 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 oh, okay have robots expressed different type of behavior in any circumstances has the has it been ever recorded do robots respond differently to men and women? No, no, no. It's, oh. it's like, like do, do robots have, like, personalities? Is that kind of what you're no, no, they don't have personalities. <coughs> but do they... Because when the robot left the house, it's a sign of some sort of a behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm. So can this... Has there been recorded such a behavior to be different in an obvious way? Like male or female or something like that? So, like, do some robots decide they're going to escape, whereas others are like, I love my job, I'd never leave? Kind of thing, yes. Ah. Ah, so variability in robot behavior. (laughs) uh... I would not be surprised if someone had studied that, but we did not not get that deep into that literature. Um, So I don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately. And then the question of which technology is closest. So for almost every chapter, we tried to include... Uh, the, uh, the range of technologies that went from stuff that's happening now, like, for example, SpaceX with the reusable rockets, way out to stuff that may never happen, uh, and if it does happen, it's probably pretty long away or pretty far away, like the space elevator. Uh, the chapters that probably have the most stuff that's happening now are synthetic biology and precision medicine, would you agree? Yeah, augmented reality. Is, yeah. And augmented reality, yeah. yeah. So those, those are the three technologies where a lot of the 
the exciting stuff is happening right now. Um, and we're happy to talk more about any of those if you'd like. But those are the, the three that I think are closest on the horizon. Sure. Thanks for your questions. And there, there's a question just a couple rows up. Um, these are all really exciting topics that you've been uh, talking about, but uh, it strikes me that these are all kind of very, very pragmatic, practical things that can help the world in a, in a tangible way. I was wondering if there was, if you did any research into things like, um, uh, for example, robots creating art or music or things like that, which are maybe less uh, um, practical. I, I don't remember robots creating art or anything, but yeah, almost all these have some purely aesthetic value. Uh, I, I actually think there, there, there's a serious argument that most of the utility of space is aesthetic. Uh, there, there's not an obvious economic, I've, I've argued with you about this, but there's not an obvious economic incentive to go to the moon. Um, but we, we spent many, many billions of dollars to put people there, uh, I think in part because it satisfies some aesthetic human urge. Um, we also, with brain-computer interfaces, there were actually some examples of people uh, who made these sort of orchestras where an EEG um, uh, would read uh, neuron patterns and then output a certain note and so people could play uh, something like an instrument using a brain computer interface. They, they sound pretty bad, uh, I should say. Uh, it's pretty, I guess it's pretty hard to control a certain brain wave to make a particular note. You're better off with a guitar. Um, but it's still cool. People are working on this sort of thing. Um, and, and maybe someday you can imagine a really cool world where you can just sort of output a song from your brain. You don't have to go through the task of learning how to use a particular instrument. Um, augmented reality obviously has all sorts of... So, so for people who don't know augmented reality, if you ever played Pokemon Go, augmented reality is just kind of like a really advanced version of that. You imagine instead of the Pokemon kind of floating here, it's actually on the table. It casts the right kind of shadow. It makes a certain noise when it walks. Um, but it's, of course, not really there. It's in a database somewhere. It's projected into your eyes. Um, a lot of the ideas for that, we, we do talk a lot about the practical use. Um, that's the majority of that chapter. But a lot of the current stuff is entertainment value. Or even, uh, I don't know, you might say spiritual value. There have been talk of having programs where you could go to the grave of someone and maybe see the real person who you know recorded themselves into AR, sort of float above it and talk to you in some way. Or you could go to, um, there's one group uh, in the US who was proposing making it so you go to Civil War battle sites and you can see the battle in progress in the place where it happened just by having like a set of goggles. So uh, I would say in, in, I don't know about the majority, but in a lot of these we do talk about aesthetic value. Um, that, that's certainly important to us too. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly mentioned briefly with the um, robotic construction. I mean, the main utility is, of course, economic and, and like helping poor people who can't afford houses. But it's also the case um, that, like, right now, a lot of modern housing construction uses prefab parts. There's something that's just a little less engaging uh, than what it was like, you know, 150 years ago when there was a stonemason building things on the site. Um, a robot who replaces a construction worker could have the ability to combine like woodworking skill and marble sculpting skill and all sorts of other things that are either um, not available to the middle class. Or, or to some extent just lost skills. Uh, so you can imagine just having more aesthetically pleasing architecture being something that middle class or even poor people can afford. So there, there are aesthetic things in almost all of these chapters. There's a question over there. Uh, so how far uh, do you think that we can take robotic automation or robotic replacement until it stops being constructive? Because there must be a point uh, where if you're investing more into robotics and replacing more uh, tasks with robots mm -hmm. uh, in the name of efficiency, there must be a point where the robots start getting better at doing more and more. And eventually, sort of, you know, the only human skill we have left is programming robots, and then someone will design a robot to do that. So <laughs> does, does there come a point where, uh, in fact, it's actually no longer constructive to have robots fulfilling our original tasks? So uh, there's debate over the answer to that question. Uh, in fact, there's an intelligence squared US debate where uh, one side argues that it would actually be great if we got to the point that you were talking about, where no one had to work ever again because we had robots that did everything, robots that write the software for robots that can do new stuff uh, that don't already exist. And we can all just stay home uh, or go on walks, and we can paint and talk to each other and maybe write symphonies that hopefully are better than what the robots would have come <laughs> up with, but maybe not. Um, and so there, there are those that argue that, that that should be the end goal of robotics, uh, and then there are those who argue that that would not be a very great life. So, so I don't know where you stop. There's a, there's a really good uh, book, it's a bit thick, um, by a guy named Robin Hanson. He's an economist called The Age of M. I recommend it only if you're really interested in this topic because it is, it is pretty dense. Um, but discussing the idea, M in the sense of a human brain emulation, like what, how the economy is going to work if we have these things. Uh, and and he's, 
he thinks it's going to be really kind of bizarre and strange. There'll be like the equivalent of a trillion brains working all the time and a rapidly growing economy. And I don't know what'll happen to humans in that environment, but maybe nothing good. Um, one, one, one not great, but slightly better version of that is via brain computer interfaces, we are able to sort of keep up. So instead of disappearing, we kind of combine with machines. Doesn't sound super great, but maybe better than annihilation. Uh, yeah. And we've got uh, one more question from back there. Yeah. Um, uh, someone sent me an article today about a guy who injected CRISPR components into himself. Yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> but um, in, to affect myostatin. Did you come across people who were kind of in that space, who were interested in kind of enhancing themselves in weird ways? Ah, so um, my, my sense of CRISPR-Cas9 is that we're not quite at the point yet where you would want to be make, so you, I think we're starting to get to the point where we're working on fixing diseases that are caused by like one gene and you can fix that one gene uh, and make people's lives better. I think we're many steps away from where we could say, I wanna become smarter, so I'm gonna use CRISPR-Cas9. So like traits like that are very complicated, involve many, many genes. Uh, but in terms of are people home testing with CRISPR-Cas9, uh, I hope not. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if the answer were yes, but uh, I hope not. But I know, um, so there's like a, so I study parasites and there's a, I guess I won't get too thick into this, but th there's a, a theory that parasites are important for the functioning of our immune system. And if you don't have at least a small number of them, you might end up with autoimmune diseases where your immune system attacks yourself. And I know there's a whole group called, I think the hookworm underground or the parasite underground, where they're infecting themselves and collecting data. So there are definitely people who uh, are frustrated by the pace of technology and the pace at which technologies are applied to humans or the pace at which medical research uh, is going who eventually do research on themselves. But I would not suggest it because there, there's a group in China who somewhat recently used CRISPR-Cas9 uh, on some human cells and what they found was that it ended up accidentally messing up a lot of uh, genes that like, so the CRISPR didn't always go to the right spot. Uh, so how I should have started the answer to this question was by telling everybody that what CRISPR does <laughs> uh, is it cuts a part of your DNA and then you throw some extra genetic material in there and after you cut that DNA out, whatever gene you wanted to put in there gets sort of pasted in. So you can take out genes and put in new genes. And so you could fix diseases by taking out uh, a gene that codes for a disease and causes a problem and putting a healthy version in. Um, so anyway, it wouldn't surprise me if people were doing that, but I think that you, at the, where the technology is, you could have a lot of errors, you could have a lot of genes that could get messed up that you don't want messed up, uh, and it would be very dangerous. So I hope people are not doing that, but I would not be surprised if they are. <laughs> so uh, please give a warm round of applause for our wonderful speakers, Kelly and Zachary. <laughs>